Welcome. Small Things Forgotten is a small podcast about archaeology. The small parts. The people and places that even archaeologists might not remember, although once you mention it, they might recall it. Archaeology is about remembering at its most basic definition. To remember. To put the pieces back together. So where did all this start? People have always been curious about their past. People might know their grandparents or great-grandparents and were told stories about their earlier family, but that's about as far as it goes. The distant past is not a part of our world, and so it's no wonder that when Romans found flint arrowheads, they kept them as a curiosity. That sort of stone tool technology died out in Europe generations before, and there was no living memory of people who made or used them. In medieval times, stone arrowheads were not even thought to have been made by humans. They were fairy shot, arrowheads of the folk who lived under the mounds or the fairy hills, which did have a grain of truth since prehistoric people were buried under those mounds. Over time, people who were ancestors became someone else, a different race, aliens who were unconnected to the modern medieval people. But collecting curios isn't archaeology. Archaeology is a systematic study of the past. Archaeology needs the contexts of where objects were found as much as it needs the objects. And it is about the information we can get from both the objects and the context. Most people don't realize that archaeology is a fairly recent discipline. In antiquity, there were a few odd people who collected old things or were curious about past civilizations. But for the most part, things didn't get rolling until the 18th century. But let's backtrack a little farther to the 5th century BCE. Herodotus, known as the father of history, studied artifacts and speculated about the distant past. A little later, Hesiod speculated about human history. He described a devolution starting from an idealistic golden age, followed by a silver age that wasn't quite as ideal, to a bronze age, and finally his current time, a thoroughly debased iron age in which people are manipulated by lies and there's no divine help against the evil in the world. The social contract was abandoned and the gods left the humans to their own devices. Much later, Ovid describes a similar downward spiral, starting with an idyllic golden age, a silver and bronze age, ending finally in his current iron age, when people were warlike and greedy. These writings were, for the most part, based on speculation. Although Herodotus may have examined artifacts, it could have influenced his idea of an earlier age when people used bronze tools. There are other individuals who had archaeological interests, whose names have been recorded. In the 27th century BCE, there is Camuset, son of Ramesses II. He searched out ancient monuments and set about restoring them. King Nabonidus led excavations in 550 BCE to find and later restore the ruined temples of Samas, the sun god, the temple of the warrior goddess Anunitu, and a sanctuary built by Naram Sin. He also used his culture's knowledge of prehistory to date artifacts that were recovered. In China, archaeology developed during the Song Dynasty that lasted from AD 960 to 1279. By the way, these are Western dates in the Common Era. Confucian scholars collected artifacts much the same way as later European antiquarians would look for curiosities or treasure. There was some debate over motives, since others felt that rather than just being treasure, the artifact should be used to further the interests of science and to be used to reverse engineer lost ancient technology. And no list of ancient archaeology would be complete without mentioning St. Helena, the patron saint of archaeologists. She lived from A.D. 248 to 330. She was the mother of Constantine the Great and was elevated to being a co-emperor with him. Being an early Christian, she was keen on visiting the Holy Land. 
Once there, she set about finding the site of Jesus' tomb and building a church there. She then excavated Mount Golgotha, the site of the crucifixion, where she found three crosses. In what could have been the first example of artifact testing, she called to have a woman who was near death come and touch each of the crosses. The first two tested neg negative, but when she touched the third cross, she was cured. Helena didn't write the reports herself, but accounts of her discoveries were written up by her son, Constantine, and St. Ambrose and Rufinius of Concordia. Not content to have found the actual cross, Helena also found the nails used in the crucifixion, a piece of the rope that tied Jesus to the cross, and a bit of his shirt. Many of the artifacts she recovered were stored in her private chapel, which is now the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Rome. So, a little summary here. One of the first archaeological expeditions involved an investigation of the landscape, a systematic excavation, artifact testing for authenticity, written reports, and deposition of the artifacts in an institution for curation. Not bad for a middle-aged woman in the first century. All that aside, we should jump forward a few hundred years. Of course, people continued to dig up things, mostly for private collections and cabinets of curiosities. But really, archaeology as we know it hadn't been invented yet. The term didn't even exist. In the 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment gave a new focus to archaeology. It seemed that suddenly people were curious about where these ancient objects came from, who made them, and why. The stories about the artifacts now had significance, and interested people wanted to do things systematically and scientifically. In England, things started off with, of course, with Stonehenge. Myths about Stonehenge abound. According to various legends, it was built by a giants, or by the devil, or that it was whipped over from Ireland by Merlin. There have been some investigations of the site, but things got serious when John Aubrey tackled the job of listing the great monuments of Britain. Between 1663 and 1693, he wrote the Monumenta Britannica. The first section of the work, Templa Druidum, or the Druid Temples, he describes the great stone circles at Stonehenge and Avebury. He made careful records of the circles and recorded the ring of burial pits around Stonehenge that are called the Aubrey Holes to this day. In the 1720s, William Stukeley, a physician and clergyman, also catalogued the monuments of Wiltshire. He went a step farther in noting how the ancient monuments could be related in the landscape and approached excavation like an anatomical dissection. Building on the work of contemporary geologists, Stukeley applied the same principle of geological stratigraphy to archaeology, that the layers of soil represented succeeding generations and periods of time, with the bottom layers being the oldest. Pompeii was almost discovered several times. Architects and engineers kept running into bits of the ancient city, but ignored it in order to get the jobs done. Then in 1738, Herculaneum was discovered when workmen were digging foundations for a new palace for Charles Bourbon, the King of Naples. The finds were astounding. The King was impressed, and excavations commenced. Then in 1748, Pompeii was discovered. Both sites have been excavated continuously since then, developing more systematic and scientific techniques as the field of archaeology progressed. In the U.S., Thomas Jefferson is credited for the first systematic archaeological excavation when, in 1784, he excavated a Native American burial ground on his land. He approached the site with specific questions that he expected to be answered by excavation and was the first to do an archaeological section, where he cut a path through the mound, observing the layers of burials, the condition of the bones, and noting that because of the lack of weapons such as arrowheads or spearheads, that it was not a mass grave after a battle. 
He wrote a detailed report that was published in Notes of the State of Virginia. According to the records, he didn't take any of the bones or artifacts. After his curiosity was satisfied, he gave up excavating. In the next century, things got rolling and archaeology started to be identified as a science and to develop its own terminology. Kristen Jurgensen Thompson was setting up a museum exhibit in Denmark. In 1816, he decided to sort the artifacts into stages of developing archaeology, starting with objects of stone, then bronze, followed by iron. He was the first to systematically sort the ancient past based on artifact materials. The word archaeology was first used in 1607 by Joseph Hall, but he was referring to ancient history. The word didn't have its modern definition until 1837. The word prehistoric was first used by Sir John Lubbock in 1865. He also coined the terms Neolithic and Paleolithic. Which pretty much brings us up to the modern day being developed, but archaeology took a long time getting its roots established. It isn't a about just picking up some old interesting thing and setting it on a shelf, but it involves questioning, examination, and systematically looking for sites and thoughtful excavation. Someone had to think up the word archaeology and use it. Really, from our modern perspective, it's hard to believe that no one published the word prehistoric before Lubbock did. We take a lot for granted and that's why we need archaeology. It keeps things real. Artifacts and features can contradict written history, giving us another critical look at what was written down. Archaeology is also about everyone. No one wrote about peasant farmers or life in rural outposts in antiquity, but archaeological excavations reveal the lives of the rich and poor, the warriors and the weavers, what they ate, how they lived, and how they died. Archaeology is no longer about the stuff on shelves, but it's about the stories they tell about the people who made them and used them. And as technology improves, the stories get better. This podcast is produced without ads, and the only sponsors are those wonderful people who contribute to my Patreon. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to support it, check out patreon.com slash archaeology. Even a dollar or two a month will help keep this podcast going. I also have a website, Ancient Tools and Craft. It's a web page about experimental archaeology, making things and the tools people use to make them. Thanks for listening, and now go out and have some fun. Mm -hmm.